How exciting. You guys are going to be in, who's all going on the Honduras trip? All right. So it fits right in with the message this morning. We're talking about engaging people with the gospel. So uh, what I'm sharing, I'm sure you guys know because you're about to do that. We have the group who's down in Kentucky going to be engaging people with the gospel. Like Pastor Brad said, though, we don't have to go to Honduras. We don't have to go to Kentucky. We can go to our families. We can go to our workplace. We can go to our neighborhoods the clubs we belong to, and we can engage people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. We're going to look at a story in the life of the Apostle Paul, how he engaged people with the gospel in Athens, and then after that, we're going to talk a little bit about what we can learn from that, how we can engage people with the gospel, and then lastly, we're going to share a little bit about the journey that uh, the Lord has, Lori and I, on as we're going to be planning a church down in Adrian, Michigan. We've, we've actually lived for the last six years, I don't know if you know this or not, but I've been putting a lot of miles on the car back and forth, and uh, so that's an exciting time for us, so I'll share about that also. So let's get started. So like I said, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul, and there's no better example of someone who engages people with the gospel, and he was amazing, and uh, that's really bright, and I have contacts, so all right, that's good right there. So, everyone know what Paul's name was before he was Paul? It was Saul. And actually, some people think that his name was actually changed from Saul to Paul at his conversion. But actually, he was born. He had one parent that was Jewish. He had one parent that was Roman. So actually, he had two names at birth. And we'll see why in a moment why he took the name Paul later on. He started with the name Saul because he was a diehard Jew. But in Acts chapter 7, and we won't turn there unless you want to look at it. I'm not going to read from there. Just describe to you is the first time we're introduced to Saul, who later becomes Paul, is uh, Stephen, the first martyr, is sharing about Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead, and these Jewish men pick up stones and begin to stone Stephen to death. And Stephen looks up and he sees the Lord, he asks God to forgive the people that are stoning him, his face shone with the glory of God, and it says that Saul, the young Saul, was there holding the cloaks of the men that were throwing the rocks. So that's our first introduction to Saul. He's approving of the killing of a Christian. It says that a great persecution broke out after that. You get to chapter 9 of Acts, and you have the Apostle Paul at this point has grown older, and he's zealous for the Jewish faith, and he wants to wipe out Christians. So at one point, he's going to a town called Damascus. And does anybody know what he's going to do in Damascus? Acts chapter 9. Anyone? He's going to have Christians arrested. He wants to have them tortured, imprisoned, and killed. So he's on the road to Damascus, and it says all of a sudden, he's with a company of people, and they all see a bright light. But only he hears the voice, and the voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? He says, it's I, the risen Christ. You shall see how much you'll suffer for my name, and you'll be a light unto the Gentiles. And so eventually, the people that saw the bright light didn't understand that he had heard a voice, he went into a city, a man named Ananias laid hands on his eyes because he'd been blinded, he was healed of his blindness, and at that point, he became the Apostle Paul. He was going to be the greatest light to the Gentiles that ever existed, and aren't you glad that he did? Because if it wasn't for the Apostle Paul, many of us may not be here. That's why Paul could go on to say in Romans 1.16, who's the 116 people here? There they are. Say it with me. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And also in Galatians 2.20, Paul could say, I have been crucified with Christ. That old man saw, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live for the one who loved me and gave his life for me. So Paul and his ministry team, we're going to be looking in the book of Acts, have been traveling through Greece. After his salvation, several years later, they're going from city to city. They're starting churches. They had just been in the town of Berea. They had been in Thessaloniki before that, and there's an uprising. Some people who don't like the fact that he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus, they follow him to Berea. They say, Paul, go ahead to Athens. You'll be safer there while we finish up in Berea. So we pick it up in Acts chapter 17, if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles. And we're going to read out of Acts 17, 16 through 34. And here's what it says. Acts 17, 16 through 34. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and the New Testament. 
While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the, I'm going to get this right, Areopagus. That's how you pronounce it. I actually listened to the YouTube video that said how to pronounce it. Say it with me. Areopagus. Where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Paul of Athens, I see that in every way... People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Okay, so let's just break down a little bit what was happening with Paul. The first thing that happens, I, as I told you, he went ahead of the, his ministry team that was in Berea. He's in the city of Athens, and he's just kind of hanging out in Athens. And pretty soon, he realizes, wow, this is a spiritual city, but it's full of idols. There's like a statue and altar for this God, and for this God, and for this God. And at that point, in verse 16, when he sees all these idols, what happens to his heart? It says that he becomes greatly what? Distressed. It means he becomes really provoked within. He gets this compulsion to just share with these people what is the truth you don't have to worship an unknown god i know who that god is and I actually looked up what the original word meant in the greek the original word word means that in his heart where there was a storm so as he was in this city spending some time with the people god began to produce this a small storm that got bigger and bigger and bigger in his heart to the point that he was just distressed that the people around him didn't know the one true and living god the next thing we see if you look at the remaining verses that Paul begins to engage people in conversations, it says he was there day by day. How many days was he there before his friend showed up? We don't know. But day by day, it says he went in the synagogue with the religious people, the Jews and God-fearing Greeks, and he talked about Jesus' death and resurrection. Then he went even into the marketplace. You can just imagine him going shopping and meeting people and realizing these people are going to hell. They don't know the God that loves them. They don't know Jesus. And he's engaging them in conversations and he's not only engaging them in conversations, but he's trying to build a relationship with them so that he can find some kind of bridge where he can share the gospel. And he finds a bridge. He actually finds two bridges. And the main bridge he finds is what? They have an altar to an unknown God. You know what I think is really awesome? It's not just by chance that that altar to an unknown God was there. Again, doing a re little research, I found that actually... 
about 600 years before Paul shows up in Athens, there had been a great plague in the city of Athens. And during that plague, all the priests of all the different gods had offered sacrifices and prayers for the gods to remove the plague, and nothing was happening. All the people were dying, and their society was dying off. So someone had the idea, hey, maybe there's a god out there that could heal our plague. Let's make an altar to an unknown god. So 600 years before Paul shows up on the scene, the Athenians had built an altar and made sacrifices to an unknown god. And now Paul's here 600 years later to speak to who the unknown God is. And by the way, 600 years ago when they made that prayer to the unknown God, who I believe was our God of heaven and earth, the creator of heaven and earth, that God prevented the plague from succeeding. So Paul uses this as a bridge. He says, I'm getting to know the people. Here's something in their life that I can relate to my faith that I have in Jesus Christ. And that's an important point to make that when we deal with people, we're going to find connection points where we can share the gospel. And then he goes on to share his message. He says, the God that you don't know, I am going to proclaim to you. First of all, he says he's the creator. He's the creator of heaven and earth and that he's spirit. He's not of man-made things like uh, idols. He's sufficient in himself. He says he doesn't need us, but he wants us. He says that he gave life to everyone. Paul also says in this passage that he made all people and determined the times and places for them to live. Why? so that they would seek him, and in seeking him, they would find salvation. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, that God determines the time and the places of every one of us. So here's what I'd like you guys to do right now for a moment before we continue. I want, to think, I want you to think about the family that you're in. I want you to think about the church that you're in. I want you to think about the place where you work. I want you to think about your school. I want you to think about your neighborhood this community or our outlying communities from Williamston, why are you there? I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, according to what the Apostle Paul tells us through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you are there not by chance, not by coincidence. And if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, if there's someone in your life who doesn't know Christ, you are there to engage them with the gospel. Not only about what you do by serving and loving them, but also to give them a verbal witness. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17 that faith in God comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So unless someone opens up this book or you open it up for them through a verbal witness, people are not going to be able to hear and understand and be saved from their sin. So we have a great responsibility to engage people like Paul did. He also goes on to say that God is close to us all. And again, he finds another bridge in our culture. He quotes a poet that says um, that that God is not far from, from any of us. And so he's been learning the people's culture. He's been learning the history of these people. He's been looking for connection points to share the gospel. And he set a great example for us. So Paul preached then the truth of Jesus Christ to the people with boldness and love. And everybody became a Christian, right? No, we're told the first thing that happened is they sneered. What's another word for sneered? They mocked him. They made fun of him, okay? So that was the first reaction. That says other people had some interest. Some people weren't interested. Some wanted to hear more. But it did say that when he shared the gospel, when he engaged people with the truth of Jesus Christ, death and resurrection, that some people were saved and were given the names of two of them. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to uh, transition into what does this mean for us? And so we're going to start those slides coming up back there, and you'll find these uh, in your bulletin if you'd like to fill these in. So what does Paul teach us about engaging people that he's put in our lives? How can we engage them with the gospel? Number one is to spend time with people in their world. I mean, you can go out door to door, you can go out in a big crusade and share the gospel and people will find Christ, but you look again and again at the example of not only Apostle Paul, but everyone in the New Testament of Jesus Christ himself, when he engaged people, when they engaged people with the gospel, it was always through relationship. And so spending time with people is crucial to share Christ. If you know Christ as your Savior, people in your life who don't yet know Jesus in your life are there for a reason, to hear the truth and find a relationship with the Lord. And so you need to spend time with people. There's going to be bridges in people's lives. Everybody has a story, right? How many of you were born into a Christian family? Raise your hand. Okay, that's your story. How many people came to the Lord as, as children? 
and your family wasn't Christian. You have a story of how that happened. How about as teenagers you came to Christ? How about as adults of any age? Okay, we need to learn people's story. There's people right now, there's things happening in their life that has happened in their life that we can use as bridges to lead people to Christ. And you know, a lot of times we don't even look for those things. Uh, we go to work, and usually what's our main concern at work? Make money, do a good job, right? Be a witness for Christ, but maybe not give a, a verbal witness. If we would just look at our families, our workplaces, our school, our neighborhoods, the places where God has placed people that don't know Christ, and we would just do this one thing. Get our eyes off ourselves and put it on people that don't know Christ. Pray for them, spend time with them. I think we'd be amazed at the things that God would reveal to us that would be bridges to share the gospel. So I would encourage you to do that. Secondly, allow God to develop a distressed heart in you for others. Do you really believe the scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life? Do you really believe John 14, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There were seasons in my life as a Christian where I was not distressed over lost people. And I can say... I'll just say that with sin. If you're a Christian who's accepted the free gift of salvation, and there's people in your life that don't know Christ that are going to hell, and you have no provocation in your heart, no compulsion to share Christ, no distress, no storm brewing inside for their eternal soul, then I would say you're, you're not walking right with God as a Christian. And I've been there as a Christian. So how do you get back? You come to God and you say, God, I'm sorry. You died for that person just as much as you died for me. You ask God to break your heart for people without the Lord. And I would encourage you to do that every day, to ask God to break your heart for the people in your life that do not know him. Paul's distressed, distressed heart for people's spiritual ignition with God came about from a changed perspective. If you would turn to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want to read verses 14 through 21. Because Paul didn't always have this brokenness in his heart for non-believers. He loved non-believers. Because they didn't believe in Jesus. But this is how his perspective changed. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. For Christ's love compels us, Paul says, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. This is where his heart towards people changed. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do, no, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. And this is all from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There was this compulsion in Paul's life that God wants us to have. Do we really understand what Christ did for not only our salvation, but for the salvation of other people. Do we really see that we're reconcilers, taking people that are lost in sin, joining them up with the Holy God through faith and the blood and resurrection in Jesus Christ? Do we really see ourselves as ambassadors from heaven, which is another country, so we can bring people along with us into eternity? That's the kind of heart we need to have for people. Does your heart break for people around you that live life without a relationship with God and no hope of eternal life? If not, ask God to break your heart. God's heart is broken for the lost. Thirdly, as Paul gave us as an example, we need to pray and look for spiritual bridges to share Jesus with people. Where has God already been working in people's lives, preparing them to hear the message and be open to Jesus? He's been working, you know. And in the Wesleyan tradition, we have a great couple words for this. It's called prevenient grace. The Bible says the moment you put faith in Christ, that's saving faith. The moment you want to be totally sold out for that Lord who saved you, that's sanctifying grace but there's this whole time before you come to know christ and the doctrine is called prevenient grace and you see it all over the scripture we talked about it how god 600 years before 
they had this altar to an un unknown God, and then Paul was able to appeal to that bridge. There's all kinds of things in people's life where God is at work. And so I'd really encourage you, as you begin to engage people that don't know Christ, they're in your life, realize that God has already been working there. He's been working there through things that they've read, through people that have been in their life, through experiences they've had. And so I would say probably all the time, when you engage someone with the gospel, God has been at work somehow there. Even with our friends from China, they've had no background in the Bible and Christianity. I can talk to them and see, you know, they have a big value on morality. That's a bridge that God has used. He's been using that as prevenient grace to show them that they can't be perfectly moral. They're sinners that need a savior. So look for those things in people's lives and look for how you can share Christ with them. And then number four, share the gospel in love and without compromise. Sometimes we may want to see people rescued from a life of sin and its consequences so much that we may not share enough about God's love and grace. Other times, we may not want to be too offensive to people's lifestyles, so we stress God's unconditional love, but we don't address the need to repent from sin. Paul had the perfect balance. He loved people, but he didn't compromise the message. We have to love them, but not water down the gospel. And a few years ago, a video came out by a uh, Christian um, spoken word guy named Propaganda. I'm sure you guys have probably seen it. Some of the adults may have. But I wanted to show it because it just shows you the powerfulness of the gospel. God created us to be with him. Our sins separate us from God. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. Life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. It's an uncompromising gospel that loves people. It's about five minutes, but I think it's worth it if you haven't seen it. If you've seen it, celebrate it again. Let's take a look at it. Propaganda. It's the full story of life crushed into four minutes. The entirety of humanity in the palm of your hand crushed into one sentence. Listen, it's intense, right? God, our sins, paying everyone life. The greatest story ever told that's hardly ever told God. Yes, God, the maker and giver of life. And by life, I mean any and all manner and substance, seen and unseen, what can and can be touched, thoughts, image, emotions, love, atoms, and oceans, God. All of it is handiwork, one of which is masterpiece, made so uniquely that angels look curiously. The one thing in creation that was made with his imagery, the concept so cold, it's the reason I stay bold, how God breathed in a man and he became a living soul. Formed with the intent of being infinitely, intimately fond, creator and creation held an eternal bond. And it was placed in perfect paradise till something went wrong. A species got deceived and started lusting for his job and odd list of complaints. As if the system ain't working and used that same breath he graciously gave us to curse him. And that sin seed spread through our soul's genome. And by nature of your nature, your species, you participated in the mutiny, our, yes, our sins. It's nature inherited, black in the human heart. It was over before it started. Deceived from day one and led away by our own lust. There's not a religion in the world that doesn't agree that something's wrong with us. The question is, what is it and how do we fix it? Are we eternally separated from a God that may or may not have existed? But that's another subject. Let's keep grinding. Besides trying to prove God is like deep in a lion, homie. It don't need your help. Just unlock the cage. Let's move on on how our debt can be paid. Short and sweet. The problem is sin. Yes, sin. It's a cancer. An asthma, choking out our life force, forcing separation from a perfect and holy God. And the only way to get back is to get back to perfection. But silly us, trying to pass the course of life without referring to a syllabus. This is us. Keep up your good deeds. Chant, pray, meditate. But all of that, of course, is spraying cologne on a corpse. Or you could choose to ignore it as if something don't stink. It's like stepping in dog poop and refusing to wipe your shoe, but all of that ends with how good is good enough. Take your silly list of good deeds and line them up against perfection, good luck. That's life past your pay grade. The cost of your soul, you ain't got a big enough piggy bank, but you could give it a shot. 
but I suggest you throw away the list because even your good acts are an extension of your selfishness. But here's where it gets interesting. I hope you're closely listening. Please don't get it twisted. It's what makes our faith unique. Here's what God says is part A of the gospel. You can't fix yourself. Quit trying. It's impossible. Sin brings death. Give God his breath back, you owe him. Eternally separated, and the only way to fix it is someone die in your place, and that someone gotta be perfect, or the payment ain't permanent. So if and when you find a perfect person, get him or her to willingly trade their perfection for your sin and death in. Clearly, since the only one that can meet God's criteria is God, God sent himself as Jesus to pay the cost for us. His righteousness. His death functions as payment. Yes, payment. Wrote a check with his life, but at the resurrection we all cheered because that means the check cleared. Pierced feet, pierced hands, blood-stained son of man, fullness, forgiveness, free passage into the promised land. That same breath that God breathed into us, God gave up to redeem us. And anyone and everyone, and by everyone I mean everyone, who puts their faith and trust in Him, and Him alone can stand in full confidence of God's forgiveness. And here's what the promise is, that you are guaranteed full access to return to perfect unity by simply believing in Christ and Christ alone. You are receiving life. Yes. ashamed of the gospel it's the power of God you know that what was shared by propaganda is the same exact message that the apostle Paul shared just a different format and God has a format for you to share with people you need to share with them in relationship by spending time with them you need to trust that the Lord has been there before you planting seeds and providing bridges where you can share the gospel you need to share with love and without compromise. And finally, you need to leave the results in God's hands. Just keep loving people unconditionally. Paul was mocked. He was actually beaten, you'd see later on in the book of Acts. He had people not interested in what he had to say. He had those who wanted to hear more. And some people believe the message of Jesus. It's going to be the same with us as we engage people with the gospel. We shouldn't expect that people are going to treat us any different than he did people of old who shared Christ. But we need to be faithful to share because it is the power of God to change lives. So what's your Athens? I'm going to share a little bit about our church plant, Adrian, to close, but I want to just take a moment right now before we get into that, is I want you to think about what is your Athens? I mean, do you truly look at the people at work that don't know Christ with a distressed heart, the people in your home who maybe don't live with you anymore but don't know Christ? Is your heart distressed? Is there a storm inside for their salvation? You feel compelled to share Christ with them. What about the people in your school? What about the people in your neighborhood? Where's your heart when it comes to being broken for the people that don't know Jesus Christ and are heading to hell? So I just want you to bow your heads for a moment. And I just want you to think about the people in your life that God wants you to engage with the gospel. And as your eyes are closed, I don't want you to just think about one person that you're pretty sure that if they were to die today, they'd be separated from God for all eternity because they've never put simple childlike faith in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection and asked Jesus to come into their life. And as you're thinking about that person, I want you to ask God quietly to say, God, give me a distressed heart for this person. Start a storm in my soul that will not be quenched until I do all I can do to see this person in eternity with me. And believe that God will answer that prayer. And then secondly, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, propaganda said it very well. The Apostle Paul has said it. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If we try to get salvation, eternal life through good deeds, by meditating, through prayer, anything we try to do, it's like putting perfume on a corpse. It's still going to stink. 
because we're never going to be good enough to be with the holy God who loves us. So I would encourage you, if you've never told God that you need him, say, God, I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness, and you offer it freely. Jesus, please come into my life and make me your child so that I can spend eternity with you, but also live for you on this earth and engage people with your glorious and wonderful and powerful gospel. Amen. So I'm going to transition a little bit now into Adrian. There's our cool sign. I guess every town has one. Um, we live probably about two miles west of this sign on US 223. So if you're ever coming down in Adrian, right before you get to Adrian, if you get into Adrian, you've just missed us. So back up to come see us. So the church that we're going to plant is called uh, The Journey Wesleyan Church. Um, why The Journey? Because I come to you with open arms. Who got it? Actually, the first date I ever had with my wife was my junior year homecoming. Or was this prom or my junior year? I don't know. One of the first slow dances I ever had with my wife was to the song Journey, Open Arms. So that's not the reason, but it is an added bonus. But we, we're on this journey together, and so um, you'll see the vision of that a little bit. So here's what happened. Uh, the last six years we've lived in Adrian, like I said, for the last year I've been commuting, working here, and also working with international students at Michigan State. And I was just kind of going through, you know, beyond being in the community, in which we are going to the store and the post office, these are some of the things that God has allowed us to do in the last six years. And, and in these different events that we've been, been involved in people's lives, these different activities, you know, we've really racked up a lot of relationships with people that don't know the Lord. And uh, some of them, I was a youth and worship uh, director at a church down there for about three years and ten months. And, and some of those young people and adults found the Lord are in that church. Others have come to know the Lord and they're floundering. They have no church home. There's many others that we know that haven't made a commitment to Christ yet, but they still have a really good relationship with us, and we just really believe God is showing us that if we, we, we begin a church that honors him, that through relationships that we have with these people, we believe they will not only come into the church, but get involved uh, in the life of the church and find Christ as their Savior as we engage them with the gospel. Uh, the next slide is microscopic. Um, and I made these, so I'm sorry for that. But I believe it says our mission field. Lenawee County, it's a population of about 100,000 people with about, oh, it's easy to read here, 50,000 of those concentrated within a few miles of the county seat of Adrian, including two small colleges, Santa Heights University, Adrian College, as well as a satellite campus for Jackson College. How many people have ever been to Adrian? How many people, raise your hand nice and high, said, I had no idea where Adrian was before this stellar map? Okay, so a couple of you. So that's where we live. Uh, if you look at Adrian again, you go two and a half, three miles this way on 223. That's where our actual home is. We've been there almost six years. 100,000 people in the county, about 50,000 of them concentrated around Adrian, 22,000 in the city of Adrian proper, and then some uh, different neighborhoods and um, some different subdivisions there. It's a very rural outside of Adrian. It's very urban inside Adrian, so it's an interesting mix. Next slide talks about the spiritual need of Lenaway County. You can go on MLive or citydata.com. You can find this for any county. If you look up Ingham County, it's going to be very similar. But in the, as far as the amount of people that go to church, there's 100,000 people. Only a little over 15,000 people are involved in any kind of evangelical ministry. 63,000 plus of the 100,000 on the latest census said, you know what, we're not affiliated with any congregation. And I'm going to assume if they're not in a church, I, I mean, I can't assume that they don't know Christ, but there's probably a very good chance that they don't know Christ. And if they do know Christ, you know, why not in a church so they can serve him along brothers and sisters in Christ? There's all kinds of reasons about that. So the spiritual need is great there. And we're, we're there. We're just going to try to do our part. There's a lot of great churches in Adrian that are reaching people for Christ, but there's so many people that don't know him. And, and we're going to try to serve the Lord where he's planted us. Next slide. So it's called The Journey. We come into you with open arms. I like that. I hadn't thought about that. Maybe I'll play that as our theme song every Sunday. Um, or Born and Raised in South Detroit, something like that. Close. I was in Gross Point Farms, but not quite South Detroit. Um, God's calling us to help reach the 63,000 plus people without a church home, many of whom are in need of a relationship with Christ. And so here's four things that we're going to try to do right off the bat. 
This is what we believe God is leading us to do. We're going to start a youth group. It's going to be called Journey Youth. I've already talked to some of my teens that were in my youth group there who t- currently aren't in a youth group. They, they love the Lord. They want to reach out. They just didn't stick with the youth group where I used to be youth pastor. So we're meeting for, at Chinese Buffet in a couple weeks to just pray and strategize. How can we reach kids in the community that don't know Christ, teenagers, young teens, senior teens? Uh, secondly, God's always laid out on our heart to be involved in the life of American and international students uh, at the college level. So we're going to get on campus, find ways to reach out, pray and ask God to show us how to do that at Siena Heights University, Adrian College, even those that are involved at the satellite campus of Jackson College. We're going to be developing a small group of people passionate about reaching people for Jesus through their everyday relationships. And I pray this will always stay the priority of the church, and it will be easy to start when it's small. It will be harder as it grows. But we want to be a church for people that usually don't go to church. I mean, it's that simple. And there's a lot of things that that we do in church that maybe people don't understand. I think this church is wonderful about creating an environment here at Williamson Free Methodist Church where if you're not usually coming to church, you feel comfortable. So in many ways, we want our church plant to be a lot like this church. And then the last thing, I don't know about the timing, but I'm going to pray and shoot for it, is we want to launch a worship service sometime in the fall. That means a, a praise and worship band. That means people that are gifted in hospitality. It means gifted or people are gifted in children's ministry. And then Lori and I doing the preaching. And uh, by God's grace, we'll be able to do that. Is there more? And there's one more. So how can you join us? Um, right now, through the ministry with international students at Michigan State, we have 49 people that pray for us. About 22 people. 22 of those people in uh, a church um, gives us monthly support. So what we're going to be doing, and Adrian, everything that I'm going to be doing, I have to raise all my income as a missionary. One really huge praise is Linda Duke and the Missions Committee recommended to the church that um, we be given $208 a month through Williamson from Methodist Church, and so we've been approved for that. That's huge. We have some people that are going to follow us with their donations, but we also need other people that can just give. And if someone wants to give to the mission, the vision of reaching people for Christ in Lenaway County through our church plant, there's different ways you can give. And on that card, you can just check it, and I can talk to you about how to do that. We have people that donate $10 a month, and then we have people that donate $300 a month and everything in between. And, you know, every month that we were here between the part-time position that we were given with the young adults here and the support that I raised and Lori's job, we, we paid every bill. I mean, God took care of us, and we believe that he'll take care of us again. And so if you're not able to give financially, that's awesome. We need people to pray. We're just talking today about engaging people with the gospel. If you guys could be praying for us on a regular basis, and if you put down that you want to get our monthly newsletter, I'll send a newsletter with names and places and events, and you just pray. And I truly believe that God hears the prayers of his people and will position people in our lives and position us in people's lives so that when we go to them, the Holy Spirit is already going to be at work because of your prayers. And um, I guess I'd just like to say, because next Sunday is our last Sunday, just say thank you. I haven't even been here a year. It's kind of been, <laughs> been like a whirlwind. But really enjoy getting to know all the young adults here. I appreciate the opportunity after 20 years to go back to Michigan State and share the gospel with international students. Because of your faithfulness to us, we saw two Chinese students come, come to know the Lord. I almost made it all the way through kind of a baby and uh, you know you guys allowed us to just be at the right time at the right place the right place at the right time with him so I appreciate that so when we leave this place in our minds we have the picture of who one person who what one person who may not know Christ God has placed that person on your heart. How will you engage them with the gospel? Take what you learned today and how the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Build a relationship. Share Christ with people. Again, they're only going to hear if they read this or if you give them a verbal witness. Okay? It's not going to happen by magic. We are God's hands. We are his feet. We are his ears. We are his eyes. We are his mouthpiece. So go in faith and do what only you can do. And and bless you guys as you go to Honduras to do that. Look forward to a great report when you get back. All right, let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for uh, presenting us such a wonderful gospel. There's no other religion in the world that has God reaching down into the filth of humanity to save us from our sins, Lord. All the other religions 
in ways to God, talk about working our way there, and we can't do it, Lord. Our good deeds are like spraying perfume on a dead corpse. It's never going to fix that stench. But Lord, we thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed on Calvary. We thank you, Lord, that three days later you historically rose from the dead, proving and, and, and giving the stamp of approval that your blood was sufficient to save us from our sins. So God, we pray now that you give us boldness. Lord, I pray right now that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, you would give us a faith and a love and a distressed heart for people who don't know Christ like we've never had before. And Lord, we would go forth and share your gospel, this glorious gospel, with much love and without compromise, God. And we'll give you all the thanks for the opportunities we have even this week. In Jesus' name and all God's people pray. Amen.